All right, everybody, welcome. We are at the top of the hour and gonna, going to go ahead and get started with today's episode of Net DevOps Live. My name is Hank Preston and I'm your host today, but joining us today is John McDonough. John is going to be taking us through Ansible uh, custom modules and roles and showing how you can extend your network automation with Ansible using these more advanced topics as they go through. As always, if you have any questions during today's session, please use the Q&A panel in the WebEx. I will be monitoring those questions and answering them throughout today's session. If you're looking for the webinar resources, they're already posted up on NetDevOps Live in the webinar resources for this session, including the slides and links to sample code, learning labs, and sandboxes. If you have any um, other questions during the session, remember, use the Q&A panel. With that, I'll hand it over to John to take us away. Thanks. Thanks, Hank. Appreciate it. Uh, hello, everybody. Glad you could join me today. Uh, as Hank mentioned, we are talking about better Ansible network automation with roles and custom modules. I'm John McDonough. I am a DevNet developer advocate, and I focus on data center automation uh, with a, a good concentration on data center compute. That's uh, one of my favorite, but we are talking about some network automation today. I'm also an Ansible contributor. I've uh, contributed uh, several modules to Ansible that are part of Ansible Core. And I've spoken about Ansible contribution at Ansible Fest, at South by Southwest, at DevNet Create, and I will also be um, speaking this June at Developer Week New York City. However, you know, there's always something for me to learn. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about Ansible roles versus modules. What's the difference? Uh, then we'll talk about making a module. Uh, typically, modules are made with Python. They are self-documenting, and they provide item potence for what they are doing. We'll get a little bit deeper into that when we start talking about modules. Then we'll talk about making a role. Roles are self-contained, they are portable, and they are loosely coupled, meaning that there isn't a lot of information um, contained in them that would make it tied to some other playbook or inventory that they're working with. And you can also share the roles that you've made on Ansible Galaxy, and I'll talk about how to share a role. Before we start, as I mentioned, I have contributed to Ansible, but there is much I don't know. Uh, Ansible is, ev is evolving, so what may be true today could be less true tomorrow. And I'm always happy to know a better way. So if there's something I talk about here today, I'm glad to hear some feedback. If there is something that I, that's different now than when I, um, when I had uh, previously, uh, you know, exercised or done what I've what I've been showing. So a lot of times I get this question: What does Ansible mean? And the name refers to a fictional instantaneous hyperspace communication system, Ansible. Uh, and this was featured in uh, Orson Scott Card's book Ender's Game. Uh, and it kind of makes a lot of sense to name the product this way, as it reaches out and touches multiple endpoints and gives you quite a bit of control to uh, communicate with those endpoints. So Ansible roles and modules. So what's the difference? Roles are like the instructions. Uh, they're self-contained and portable. They are written in YAML. You can use them for common configurations that you'd like to share throughout your organization or with the rest of the community, Ansible community. You can use them to enforce standards. Roles are called from a playbook. Now, if roles are the instructions, modules are the tools. And typically, modules do one thing well. The majority of modules are written in Python. However, you can see quite a few that are written in PowerShell. And actually, um, you can write the modules in anything you'd like, uh, but we'll be talking about Python today because typically roles are written in Python. Or excuse me, modules are written in Python. Modules use the APIs and or CLI tools for the particular thing that you're connecting to. Today we'll be using module that connects to the endpoints API. Modules are meant to abstract complexity from the user. Users shouldn't have to know the API commands or the API calls or the CLI commands or the CLI syntax. They should only have to know how to fill out the playbook and the task inside that playbook for the module that they're calling. Modules are called from an Ansible task. So while roles are the instructions, modules are the tools. 
Now, if you want to make a module, you can make a module for a number of reasons. You can make a module because there's something lacking in, um, in your efforts or there's a, 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 maybe there's a, an operation that you'd like to uh, make more concise or you'd like to take a, um, a call that uses the shell or command uh, module within, um, within Ansible and turn that into something that's more uh, contained or using the API or, or something that's better suited for a playbook. So there are many reasons why you'd want to make a module. You may want to contribute that module that you've made to Ansible and, um, and be able to share that with others. Now, to make a module, we're going to use Python. We're going to create and activate a virtual environment. I'll be using Python 3. Um, Python 2 is supported, but I'll be using Python 3 today. We'll activate that virtual environment, and then we'll install in that virtual environment Ansible, and then some other things that we need for the module that we're making today. Uh, in this case, I'll be installing requests, and I'll also be installing PyLint just to check and make sure that my code looks good. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this environment. We'll start by making our environment. Now, in this case, I'm, like I said, I'm using Python 3. I've already created a directory called NetDevOps Live that I'm going to be doing my work in. So I'll be using Python 3 and calling the virtual environment module. And I'm also going to name my environment VENV. If you do end up contributing to Ansible and going through the Ansible contribution uh, instructions, they do recommend naming your virtual environment VENV. So I'm sort of sticking with what you would see if you went through the process of actually creating a module to contribute to Ansible. So we'll make this virtual environment and then we'll activate it. Now activating it means that we're setting up with it, sort of a, a walled environment for what we'll be doing in our virtual environment. So we'll go ahead and activate it. Sorry, typo. You can see when we activate the virtual environment, our prompt changes to show in parentheses the name of the virtual environment that we're in. Now when we use the commands within the virtual environment, they are actually related to just this environment. So when we do a pip install Ansible, it's installing for this environment. We'll also install requests and pilot. Those are the only two other modules that I need for this environment to create my module. Now, if I was using something that had an SDK, or if I was creating a module for some other environment um, than the one we're using today, I would have to install those SDKs into my environment here so that my module could utilize them. Also, I've included, when you get the resource materials, I've included a link on the bottom of this slide on the, um, the, the web page for developing modules for Ansible. So I'm also going to go ahead and install requests. If you're not familiar, requests is a module, uh, a Python module that allows you to interact with um, uh, REST APIs. And I'm going to install PyLint. And PyLint is a Python module that lets us look at our code and make sure it's formatted in a way that is um, sort of goes along the, the guidelines of what Python code should look like. Doesn't mean your code will work, but it will mean that your code uh, looks like another Python developer would expect it to look. So we've created our environment, we've installed the tools that we need. A little bit about what a module looks like. Modules have a few different sections, a few distinct sections, I should say. They start with the shebang, that's that hash, uh, hashtag uh, exclamation point user bin Python. Now this is for the Ansible system itself. So this is not your Python interpreter, but this is what the Ansible system is looking for when it looks at a module. So that's the way it should look. 
We have documentation. Documentation is the module author, the module name, a short description, a long description, and then the options and some examples of how you use the module. There's the imports that will bring in the Ansible uh, Python modules that we require for um, creating a, um, an Ansible module. Inside that main section next in the code, we'll have the Ansible module class, which defines the argument specification, the required if section, and if this module supports check mode. And I'll show you that code in just a bit. And then the module has a section where we determine the state and we update if required. So when you make a module, you want to determine the state is this object existing? Has it changed if it exists? Should it exist and it doesn't exist? So there's a few different states that we'll look at that determine what we'll do next in the code. And depending on what we'll do next, we'll either update, we'll delete, we'll create. It really depends on what the state is that we're looking for uh, in the module that is coming from the playbook. And then we'll exit with a result. So let's take a little bit or let's take a look at what that would look like. So I've created in my environment here where I've installed requests and the Ansible and, Ansible and Pilot, I've created uh, a few things that will help you get started. Now, with Ansible, when you set up your directory structure, if you create a library directory, and in that library directory, underneath where you have your playbooks and the directory for your group variables and your host variables, if you create a library directory, any module that you put in that library directory will be run by a playbook that's in the directory just above it. Playbooks will look in the library directory that's in the directory where your playbook is. So I've created this module template to show you the different sections of a module. So again, I have the shebang that states uh, the Python interpreter, but again, this is for Ansible, not for what your system is running. Then we have the documentation section where you have the module name, the author name, short description, long description, options. So in this case, the options I have in my template are option one, option two, a description, a required, if it's required or not, and then the state. Do I want this to be present or do I want it to be absent? And then I've also put here a default that I want it to be present and choices. I have choices of present or absent. Now, this documentation section is formatted in YAML and it is important that this format is like this. Ansible doc or Ansible dash doc will read this module documentation and display it to the user for how they should use this module. So here we have a description of the module options and then further down we have examples. So this is how you would run this module. Again, formatted in YAML, it states whether or not the option, um, or, or it, it shows you different ways to use the option. If it's an update, if it's a deletion, so if it's present or if it's absent, and different ways that you can run the module. Again, this is run. This is read by Ansible-doc, so it is important that you do put it in the right format. We also have a return section. What can come back from this module? And again, we're defining some variables that will that can come back from the module. A description of what that variable is, what kind of what type it is. All these different elements are described. On, in Ansible documentation, and there's a link at the bottom of the slide that shows you uh, where to go to get that information. Now, I have a few helper functions in my module. I have, a mod I have a helper function to update the thing, and I have a module or a, a function to delete the thing. So if our state determines that we need to update it or delete it, we'll use one of these methods. Here's where I get to the Ansible specific Python module utilization. So I'm going to import from ansible.modulutils.basic, uh, I'm going to import the Ansible module class. And that Ansible module class is 
a standardized way that Ansible has provided for specifying parameters, for specifying um, the required if, and for specifying check mode. So let me show you what that means. So you create a module, you instantiate a module from Ansible module, and inside that you can specify the argument specification. It's a dictionary. Now in this argument specification, we have option one, that is a string, and I also indicate that it's required. We have option two that is a string, but it's not indicated that it's required. And if you remember from the documentation, and I'll, I can scroll back up in a moment, I am stating in my documentation that the, that the option one is required and then option two is not required. And I'm reflecting that here in the argument specification. And then I have the state. The state is a type of string, and I can also specify here that the choices are present or absent, and it defaults to present. So my argument specification is defining what I expect and what is allowed when I get that, that information. Also my module, I'm, I'm specifying something called the required if. So in this case, if I say that the state is present, option one is required. So if the state is present, option one is required. Now I can have, this is an array here or a Python list, so I can have a number of parameters specified as being required if the state is present. Or if something else, if this is set to this, then these options must be present. Or these options must have been defined. Supports check mode, I set that to true. Check mode is a way that you can run your module without it actually doing anything but ensure that it's read the parameters correctly um, and is pr would process as you expect it to. We also define the result dictionary. And in the result dictionary, we do a few things. We set changed in the result dictionary to false. We are going to start by creating our module and assuming that there are no changes to the thing that we're looking at. We've also defined that the original state and the change state in our return are set to an empty string. But the important thing here is that we're indicating that the changed state is false. We are assuming that nothing is going to be changed. We then pull from the parameters the requested state. The requested state is what we would like this module to be or to achieve uh, when it's run. Then we're also going to pull the um, parameters into local variables. Option one, I'm pulling out into a variable called option one, and the parameter option two, I'm sending equal to none because this isn't required. What I have to do is ensure that the parameter is either set to none, or if it has been passed through, that I set option two equal to that, that parameter's value was. So when something is optional, when you have a parameter that's optional, you have to ensure that you understand that it may or may not be there and then handle that accordingly. Now for this template I've just changed, I've set some uh, variables uh, for testing and I'll show you what we go through when we look at the object. So Ansible is going to do something for us. It's going to change something, update something, or create something, delete something, whatever it may be. If the object exists, now this code here uh, goes through determining the state of the object. If the object e exists and the requested state is present, we want to check and see if there were any changes to the object. So at the endpoint, we've queried it, we've determined that the object exists. Now we want to look at that object and determine, is it different than what the playbook is asking for? And if it's different than what the playbook is asking for, we're going to set that the changed value is true. We're not changing the object yet, but we're just, we know now that we have a change. So if the object is present and there's a change, we're going to set changed equal to true. If the object does not exist, if it's not present, or excuse me, if the state is not present, we don't want the object to exist, we want to delete it so that if the object exists and the state is not present, that means we want to remove it. So again, that's a change. We'll be removing the object because it exists and we don't want it to. 
If the object does not exist and we want it to be present, then we're going to create it. And again, that is a true state. We want the object to exist. So all we've done in this first section is determined the state of the object and if a change is going to happen. And this is good Ansible practice the, when creating a module. You want to determine the state and if something needs to change. Now, if something needs to change, so if changed is true and the requested state is present, we'll create or update the object if we're not in module check mode. Remember, module check mode is a what if. What if we did this? What would happen? So in this case, the object was changed. We're not in module check mode. If it was present and we want to update some component of it, in this case, it's just one of the options that we're updating, we'll update that thing. If the requested state was absent or something other than present, we'll delete the thing, we'll delete the object. So by separating state from object management or update or uh, what have you, create, delete, etc., cetera, we'll determine, um, we, that's, this is where we'll make our changes. And then we'll exit with the state change indicated and we'll call the module.exit JSON function with our result. So it's a very simple template for creating an Ansible module in Python. Now, when you create an Ansible module, Ansible modules have a contract with um, JSON input and JSON output. Python, excuse me, um, Ansible modules created with Python accept JSON in and expect and will return JSON to you. So if I look at some this module template, I've also created module template, template args in JSON, and they have this format. They're in JSON format, Ansible module args, option one, option two, and then the state that I want. And if I go into my library directory, I can run my module directly with Python, not from a playbook, so I'm just going to say Python. Module template, and I'm going to pass it my module template args. Oh, sorry, I have to activate my environment. Let's clear the screen and we'll try that again. So Python went in, or excuse me, JSON went in, option one, option two, state of present. And this said, change is true. My original state and my change state, those were part of my, re my return values. I didn't set them to anything in my module template. And that shows my invocation. It shows me my module arguments. Option one was set to option one. Option two was set to option two and my state was present. So it shows me the options that were brought in, but it showed me what happened, that my state was changed. And if we look back at the module template, we'll see that in this module template, I had a setting that the thing in option two was test, but what was coming in from my arguments was the string option two. So if I run this again, because it's just this template, nothing's actually being updated somewhere. It'll show that my state change was true. But if I go ahead in my template and I change this thing option two from test to what's actually coming in from the template or from the arguments, option two, it's just a text string. and I go ahead and run that, it'll show me false. Nothing actually changed. If I say that my argument, or that my object does not exist, and my 
arguments, my JSON arguments say that it should exist. Remember, it shows that it, we want it to be present and I run my module again. Let me just clear the screen. It'll show that change is true because the module, uh, my test code, my template says it doesn't exist and I want it to exist, so it needs to be present. So that module template is available with the code um, in, um, in uh, DevNet Code Exchange. If you go to DevNet Code Exchange at developer.cisco.com slash code exchange and search for ACI underscore modules, you'll see this repo that's out on GitHub that has that template, module template Python in it and that module template args. Now, as you've guessed from this name here, we're going to be doing something with ACI. So let's take a look at what we're going to do with ACI. We're going to go ahead and create a module called My ACI Tenant. And what this does is it creates a tenant in ACI, or it updates a tenant in ACI, or it deletes a tenant in ACI. Now this code follows the very same format as my module template. It has some documentation at the top. It has examples. In this case, the examples show that we need an ACI host name, a username and a password, a tenant name, a description. Description is optional in this case, kind of like option two in our template. And the state is present. This is what, where we would ensure that an ACI tenant is present. We can also do the same thing and change the description from tenant X, this is tenant X, to tenant X is awesome, and this would be an update. It would only change the description because it would determine if this tenant X existed, that it would update the description. And then of course, if we didn't want this tenant anymore, we would pass the same parameters, hostname, username, and password, the name of tenant X, and then the state is absent. Some return values. And in this case, because I need some other libraries, I'm importing them. I'm importing JSON, I'm importing requests. I'm also disabling the request warnings um, that I'm using an um, invalid certificate or um, a self-certified uh, self certificate. I'm importing the module again, and I'm setting up a bunch of methods that I can utilize to interact with ACI over HTTP, via the REST API. Some login, some logout, some update, some query, some delete. So these are methods that I need to interact with ACI. But once I get past those methods to interact with ACI, I have my module again. I'm defining my module specification. So here's my module dictionary. I'm required to have a host name. I have a username, a password. The password's required. I don't want to log the password anywhere, so I set the option for that parameter to not log it. The name of the tenant, the description, the state, present or absent, my required if. If the um, tenant is to be present, then this, um, if the state is present, then I need the name of the tenant and also I should port check mode. I set up my result dictionary. Again, I determine that, or I assume that nothing has changed, and so I set it to false. I get my required state, and then I pull my parameters in from my module that came in from the playbook. Very, very similar to the module template. Since description is not required, I set it equal to none, and if it is not none, if it's coming from the playbook is not none, I set, my, um, I set a local variable equal to that description that's coming in. I log into ACI. I query for that tenant. If it exists, that's great. If it doesn't exist, we'll create it depending on what the playbook says. In this case, I'm, ex I'm assuming that the existence of that tenant is false. I'm also setting a variable equal to the description that it, the current ACI tenant description, the one that I'm reading in, if it does exist, is none. And then I look at the response from that query. Does my tenant exist? In this case, for ACI, if my tenant exists, I would have a return value with a total count of one. I would set exists equal to true, and I would pull out the current description of that tenant. And I just go through that process like I showed in the module template. If it exists, and my parameter is, my description in this case, is different than the description that's part of the tenant, then that's true. If their state is present, and the results are that it, um, 
it doesn't exist, then I'm going to, excuse me, if the state is not present and the results are that it does exist, I'm going to delete it. So that means it's change is true. And then if the state is present, but it doesn't exist, we're going to create it. So state determination is separate from the update of the object itself, in this case, the tenant. So if the result is changed, my modules or uh, my object is different than what my playbook is asking for, and I'm not in check mode, I'm going to go ahead, update that um, ACI tenant. I'm going to create the payload for my REST API call, and I'll run my ACI update. Else, I will run my ACI delete and remove that tenant, and then I'll log out, and I'll issue my module, um, my module exit with my result. It's very, very similar. I've just added in how to um, interact with that object. So I have ACI args or ACI um, uh, um, JSON args, and this has my host name, username, password. I'm using the always on ACI or APIC in uh, the DevNet sandbox. I have a tenant called a hyphen tenant one. This is tenant one, and I want it to be present. And I can run this just like I did my module template. I can say Python, my ACI tenant.py, args.json. Now, let's before I go there, let's just ensure that I don't have a tenant one. I may have to log back into ACI here. Give me just a second. And get to my tenants. Well, that's fine in that. Let's, I'll talk a little bit more about what's going to happen here. Um, so I'll read those arguments in and I'll get some, I'll get some output. So let's go ahead and run that because I'm pretty sure that tenant doesn't exist. So change came back as true. I'm showing my invocation, my module args, the host name, the username, the password. You can see that no value was logged because I set the no log parameter. The name was a tenant one. The description is this is tenant one and the state is present. Let's see if I can get back into here. There we go. All right, let's log in. Now, if I run this again from here, I should get that changed is false because we've created the tenant. I haven't changed the description. And I see that changed is false because nothing changed in our, in our args.json. Now this is a way to run your module, develop your module and run it without creating a playbook. But that's not what you're going to do with your module. So we need to go ahead and create a playbook to run this module uh, as a task in that playbook. Now I do want to show you that in my, my ACI tenant.py, I had all this ACI login, ACI logout, ACI query, and that doesn't need to be in there. In fact, if you're writing a bunch of modules to interact with your APIC or some other device, you can go ahead and put them in another module. Now this is um, the only time that Ansible, or one of the few times that Ansible says more than one Python module is, um, is good or is okay for creating your own module. And this is called a, um, or what they refer to as a module util. So in this case, I wrote my ACI tenant better. And in my ACI tenant better, all those functions or all those methods um, that were part of the ACI tenant module, I actually moved them to another library um, called ACI util. And that actually lives in a directory or that exists in a directory underneath my um, my Ansible directory. So I have my library directory where my module is, but then I also have my module tills directory where utilities for this module are. And in my ACI util, it's a very straightforward um, copy of those methods out and into another 
um, another Python module, and I can call them from here. So in my MyACI tenant better, I'm just importing those methods. Now I do have a try and accept here, so I can, tr I can utilize my pylint. And there's something I want to show you about pylint. So let's just move back over to the, to the slides, and I'll show you a little bit more that you need to know. So I kind of went over the local module testing with the JSON in and the JSON out. Modules have that contract. A, a, an Ansible module expects JSON in and it will return JSON. We're going to go ahead and run this, um, this module in a playbook, but before we go ahead and do that, I just want to show you how to use PyLint in a, in a Python virtual environment. PyLint, just in your standard, um, uh, even though we installed it in our virtual environment, PyLint doesn't respect virtual environments. So in order to use PyLint in your virtual environment, you want to use this syntax, dollar sign, open paren, which PyLint, close paren, and then the name of the module that you want to check. So let me get back to that. So in this case, if I want to check these modules that I've written, I would just say dollar sign, open paren, which PyLint, and this will pull the PyLint out of my virtual environment dollar sign which pilot, and then I'm just gonna say my ACI tenant.py. And it comes back with a 10 out of 10. Now you will probably have noticed that in my um, ACI tenant, I did have some pilot uh, that messages that I'm suppressing, wrong import position, missing doc string, global statement, no member, and too many branches. When you're working on an Ansible module, there are some sanity tests that you would do for a contribution, and one of the sanity tests is to use their PyLint or their PEP8 um, module to ensure it conforms to their standard. And some of these things that you um, would see are being disabled. So I just disabled them in the top of my module here to show you them that I would get a 10 out of 10, or this would pass um, Ansible's uh, sanity test for language construction. Similarly, in my better, my ACI tenant better, the reason I have a, um, a try except for including my library is that because now that I have a module util, I need to let it know that I'm looking at it locally versus um, if it's part of the whole Ansible system. So anyway, pilot 10 out of 10 means my code meets some standards. Doesn't mean my code is good, just means it meets some standards. All right, so let's pull this module into a playbook. Now, if I look at the playbook that I've created here called site.yaml, I have a hosts file or an inventory file with a group called ACI. I'm making a local connection. I'm not gathering facts. I'm ensuring that I have a host name, username, and password. And I'm setting some information where I want to call my ACI tenant and the name and description I'm going to get from a variable. Now there's quite a bit you can do with Ansible, more than I can you know, talk about in the time we have today, but I have an inventory file, and in that inventory file I have a group called ACI. Underneath ACI I have some named instances of ACI or named instances of, of an APIC where the host name is defined. In this case, sandbox apicdc.cisco.com is in my inventory file. Now if I look in my group vars directory, I have an aci.yaml. I also have an all directory. This all works for everything in this um, Ansible environment. And it's just ensuring that the Python interpreter gets utilized is the one that's installed in my, um, my Python virtual environment. The aci.yaml that's in here applies to the group that's in my inventory file. So I have a variable called tenants and there's two entries. There's a hyphen tenant one with a description and a hyphen tenant two with a description. This is tenant one, this is tenant two. Underneath my host vars, I have a um, file that is specifically for ACI one. So remember back in my inventory, I have ACI is the group, ACI1 is my host. 
Now, ACI1 is actually encrypted with Ansible Vault. Ansible Vault allows me to put the username and password and some other things in an encrypted way that if I wanted to share this with somebody else, I could put it up on GitHub and it's, it's encrypted. Or if I wanted to um, ensure that only certain people could utilize it, I can put a password along with this. In this case, Ansible Vault allowed me to create a file. I'm just going to move up a directory and into my host vars directory. If I use Ansible Vault to create a file, I just say Ansible Vault create. If I want to create a file for ACI2, it's going to ask me for a password. And I can go ahead and put something in there, like, hi, this is ACI2, some variables, some values, whatever it may be. Go ahead and save that. And now if I look at ACI2, it's encrypted. If I want to edit ACI2, I just say Ansible fault edit, put in my password, and I can go ahead and edit that. So in this case, with ACI1, what's in there is the username and password variables that I need for the um, sandbox, sandbox apicdc.cisco.com. So I have my host variables, I have my group variables, I have my playbook, my site.yaml. It's going to call my ACI tenant. It's going to take this login info and kind of put it in a, what might be called a YAML macro. It's something that I can refer to later and have it expanded here. And I've only done this because it, it, if you have many times where you're calling a module in your playbook and you have repeated information, it uh, makes your, uh, your playbook a little bit smaller. I'm going to loop through the variables that are in that tenants variable and it will add them to the APIC. So for um, this playbook, I want the, uh, the tenants to be present. And then I've also created a playbook where the tenants are absent. So let's go ahead and run that. And I'll show you how to run that with Ansible Vault because the values are coming in from Ansible Vault. So in this case, we'll say, Ansible Playbook, and just so in case you don't remember when you're running a playbook, you can always type H for help. And in this case, what I want to just make sure I get is the, um, the ask for the vault password. So we can um, specify the vault password and have it ask, um, ask that so that when we go ahead and run this, it'll prompt us for our password. I just want to make sure I get the right. The right syntax. So it's dash dash ask vault pass. So Ansible playbook, my inventory file, my YAML file that I'll be using, and ask vault pass. Right. Now I'm just going to show you one more thing in my playbook. I'm going to just kind of pull it out for now because it's the next part of this talk the um, add networking role. We're just going to pull it out because I just want to create the uh, tenants. Let's go ahead and just check in our playbook here or in our uh, APIC. Look at the tenants. So we have a tenant one. A tenant one exists already. So we should see the playbook not make a change to that. It has the same description, but we should see a tenant two pop up. So one was 
left alone and one was changed. It shows us one was okay and one was changed. Our playbook ran. If you're familiar with Ansible, this is all good output. Everything was okay. Um, nothing failed, nothing was unreachable. We're gonna put that roll stuff back in there. All right. So, we made a module. We checked state. We updated based on the state. If we wanted it or didn't want it, if, some, if we wanted it and something changed, if it already existed, all that happened inside our module. We ran it with a playbook and we checked that uh, the code looked good uh, based on what PyLint said. And again, on the bottom of this slide are links to different um, uh, pages with the Ansible documentation for developing modules and also for um, sanity testing if you wanted to contribute your module to Ansible. Now let's talk about making a role. So I have my tenant module. I have my better tenant module as well where I, I pull in uh, methods from a shared Python module that can be used for other um, uh, other APIC modules that I may want to make. But maybe for my uh, tenants, I'm always going to have some things that are the same for them. And so while the tenant name and description may change, I may have some things that are always going to stay the same. And in that case, I maybe I want to make a role. And a role is something that I can, I, like I said earlier, that I can use to enforce a standard configuration to be consistent. Um, so you can create a role that's kind of like a, a package of tasks that you can then call from your playbook. Ansible role tools that come with Ansible are Ansible Galaxy, or the Ansible role tool is Ansible Galaxy. And you run Ansible Galaxy init with a role name and it'll create a directory structure for you. And that directory structure underneath that role name, so here I ran Ansible Galaxy init myACI role, and underneath that directory structure called myACI role, there was a readme file, a defaults directory, a files directory, handlers, meta, tasks, template, tests, and vars. And defaults are for default variables for the role. Files are for files for the role. Handlers are things that you run at task completion. Like maybe you installed a, um, a web server or you've done something on a host, that handler could then uh, turn that, that component up. Meta is if you want to publish your role at galaxy.ansible.com. Meta is information about you as the author, some dependencies, uh, lowest version number supported, etc. Tasks are tasks that the role will run. Vars are other variables for the role. And templates are templates that could be, the templates directory holds templates for the role. Now the simplest and um, easiest one is just creating tasks in the task directory. You can add variables um, to either the vars directory or the defaults directory. Now the difference between these two directories is that the vars directory has very high precedence. The defaults directory has the lowest precedence possible. If that variable definition is found nowhere else, it will be taken from the defaults directory. If it's not, if it's not found um, other, if, or if it's found somewhere other than that, then the defaults directory would not be utilized. But that is if it's found nowhere else. It's the lowest precedent uh, precedence in the um, in the environment. So let me just show you how to create a role. Let me just clear my screen here. I can just say Ansible hyphen galaxy init. And we'll call that my ACI role. It was created. And that's what's in the directory. A readme, a defaults directory with a main.yaml, files, a handlers, etc. That's how you create the um, outline for a role. Now roles you can call by um, or, or excuse me, roles have you set up tasks in main.yaml. You set up variables, like I said, in default main.yaml or also in vars main.yaml. 
And that's what I've done for the My ACI role here. There are some common things that I want to do for every tenant. And also those common things have some variables that I want specified or values for variables that I want specified for every tenant. So what I've done, let me bring up that code. Under my, let me just close it up here so it's a little bit easier to look at. Under my ACI role, under tasks, I created a main.yaml or the main.yaml was there and I filled it in. I did something very similar like I did to the playbook um, for the my ICI tenant. In this case, I want to ensure that a VRF exists or VRF exists for that ACI tenant. I want to ensure that a bridge domain exists and I want to ensure that that bridge domain subnet exists. So in this case, I'm not using Ansible modules that I created, but I am using Ansible modules that come with Ansible Core. There are a bunch of ACI modules that come with Ansible Core. So I'm mixing the module that I created with modules that come with uh, Ansible. And I'm just calling those. And these values that are being um, fulfilled here for uh, bridge domain and gateway and mask and verf, they're going to come from my vars directory. In my vars directory, I have a main.yaml, and I'm just specifying values for those variables. So I've created my main.yaml that has my tasks, and I've created the main.yaml that has my variables, and I don't have anything in my defaults. I'm just using those two tasks, or those two uh, directories, under my ACI role. When I look at my site.yaml, I have a section added for add networking. And in this add networking task, I include the role called my ACI role, so the role I've just created here, and I pass to it the tenant name while I loop through the tenants that are coming from my group vars. So there's a bunch of things going on here, and I hope you're, you're kind of seeing how this all sort of fits together. I have my main playbook that resides at my uh, directory level where group vars is underneath it and host vars is underneath it. And then also underneath that main directory where my main playbook is, is the my ACI role. So the playbook sees the my ACI role and it passes from the, play from the playbook, it passes the tenant name to the my ACI role. So if you remember when we looked at, or if you saw it, when we looked at the my ACI role and we looked at the vars, there's no tenant name in here. Just the things that I want standard with every tenant, but not the tenant name. The tenant name is going to come from the group vars, and I'm going to loop through a tenant one and a tenant two. So I'm gonna go ahead and call that. Same way as I called it before, I'm calling Ansible Playbook with an uh, inventory, the site.yaml, and I'm going to ask for the vault password. Now with Ansible, this idea of item potence is that I can run this playbook again and again and again, and nothing will change except for what needs to be changed. So we're creating the VRF, we're creating the bridge domain, and ensuring that a subnet exists for, AC, um, for tenant A tenant one. And then we're doing the same thing for A tenant two. Now if I look over here, I have in my APIC, I have A tenant one and I have A tenant two. Now if I look inside that tenant, We'll update in just a second here. I'll see that the networking was created with the VRF that I specified in my playbook and with the bridge domain called prodbd and then with the subnet that was specified in my playbook. And A tenant 2 will have the same information underneath their networking. If that's what you want to do, was to have some common information under every tenant, but then be able to specify a different tenant name. You can do that with your playbook by calling the task to create the tenant, but then calling the role for each tenant. And that's what we did here. Let's see.
So when we made the role, called it from a playbook, that role was able to make use of playbook variables as well as its own variables. In this playbook that I have, I was making the use of loops to loop through the tenants and then to loop through the tenants again, but this time add networking to the tenants. I made use of VML ankles and uh, anchors and aliases, and this way uh, I could shorten up what, um, uh, tighten up my playbook a little, a little bit by um, consolidating some repeated information into this anchors and aliases uh, capability in YAML. So you have your role and you want to contribute it. So if you want to contribute it to Ansible Galaxy, you go through the process of Ansible Galaxy init on your local system, go into that role name, that directory that you've uh, just created when you created your role, and you want to add this to GitHub. So you do a git init, you create your files and do your git adds, your git uh, commit, and then your git push to push that up to your GitHub. Then you go to Ansible Galaxy and you log in with your GitHub credentials. Once you've logged in with your GitHub credentials, you'll go to My Content, Add Content, select the role repository, and then you'll import it. And now your role that you've created is available for others to utilize by pulling it down from Ansible Galaxy. Couple of best practices for creating a shared role. Uh, the first thing, is there an existing role that already meets your requirements? And if there is, maybe you don't need to go ahead and create that role. Um, but if you do create one, you have to ensure that the name of the GitHub repo is the same as your role name. Make sure you use unique variable names. Uh, one suggestion is to use the role as a prefix for every variable in the role, you, the, the role name for every variable in the role. Make sure you list your role dependencies and information in your uh, main.yaml uh, under the meta directory. A role is reusable. It shouldn't contain any inventories or playbooks. So ensure that you're not giving this other, you're not including that information with your role. And just want to reiterate again that role variables defined in VARs have a very high precedence. They can only be overwritten by passing them on the command line in a specific task or in a block. All role variables should be defined in the defaults. Now I didn't do that in mine. I wanted to show you the VARs directory. Uh, but there is more information on how to write Ansible roles and publish them. There's a link on the bottom uh, that you can look at to ensure you uh, do a role correctly and share it correctly or meeting some best practices. So to sum up, we talked about the difference between Ansible models and roles. Ansible uh, models are task-oriented and roles are playbook-oriented. We talked about how to create an Ansible module with Python, although other languages can be used. You want to ensure that you check state, and then based on that, you make your updates. And then we talked about how to create an Ansible role. Roles are for reuse. Use them for consistency and deployments. Use them to enf enforce conventions that you would like to utilize. There's the webinar resource list. There are learning labs with and it, uh, that we have on uh, developer.cisco.com. We have an introduction to Ansible. There are a number of labs that can be utilized. We also have an ACI and Ansible lab if you're interested in doing more with ACI and Ansible. We have the DevNet Sandbox, the ACI always on sandbox that can be utilized for that ACI and Ansible lab. And then there are the code samples. If you go to DevNet's code exchange and just search for Ansible, there's a number of uh, repositories related to Ansible. There's some for ACI, there's some for UCS, there's some for NXOS. There's a number of Ansible uh, rep repositories out there on Code Exchange. There's also the code for this webinar underneath um, in DevNet Code Exchange. Uh, just search for ACI underscore modules to locate that one. There's the Net DevOps Live Code Exchange Challenge. Now, if you are inspired by what I showed you here today, I would love for you to create an Ansible module for a playbook task that currently uses the shell or command modules, or something that you find that you need in your environment and you would like to share it on Code Exchange. That would be great. Or create an Ansible role for a task or a set of tasks common to several playbooks. And think, if you think that that's something that somebody would benefit from, definitely go ahead and share that on the Code Exchange, DevNet's Code Exchange. 
And if you're looking for more about Net DevOps, there's the Net DevOps on DevNet. There's the Net DevOps Live schedule to show you the different um, uh, episodes that we have for this season and for last. The Net DevOps blogs. And then there's also the now very famous and very well done Network Programmability, Programmability Basics video course at developer.cisco.com. So be sure to check that out. This is me. If you have questions, I'd love to hear them and, and help you out. I'm John McDonough or Joe McDonough at Cisco.com on WebEx Teams. I'm at John A. McDonough on Twitter and on GitHub. I'm GitHub. Um, uh, Move a lot is my ID. Always, there's developer.cisco.com that you can follow on Twitter, Facebook, and GitHub. And with that, I want to turn it back over to Hank. Great. Thanks so much, John. This was a great session. Um, it, what's nice to see is as we're starting to move beyond some of the fundamentals and introductory topics and see how we can actually build more advanced elements to solve problems that we don't get with some of the, the built-in pieces that come along. So fantastic sec, uh, session today showing us how we can get started with those custom modules and creating roles. Well, hopefully everybody enjoyed our session and our video today. Please join us again next week where we'll be back once again with NetDevOps Live on Tuesday. Talk to you soon. Bye.